Now, as a culture of disaster, which I like about Philippines, which really is a learning lesson for many places in the world, is that these are their, you know, 12 commandments about how one deals with disaster. This is like their message to the world, and this is from a fantastic local NGO. And what they say here is this. Go to the people, live among them, learn from them, plan with them, work with them, start with what they know, build on what they have, teach by showing, learn by doing, not a showcase, but a pattern, so it's not something you can just copy paste. It's not ends, it's not odds, but ends, but a system. So it's not like this is what it was, this is what I want, but think of the system, think of the process. It's not a piecemeal, but an integrated approach. So don't just think of, you know, here you got your house, or here you have your water, or here you have this. No, think of it integrated. And it's not to conform, as in because this is what our mandate is, this is what you need to fit into, but to transform. And most important, not to relief. Don't think about relief, but to think about release, in the sense of releasing the own potentials of the people themselves who want to rebuild their own lives. To try to work very much, even though you've got money and finance and power and all your technology that will come from Europe and America, go through and with the people to make the new. Because then you get people who are working with you, as opposed to people who are dependent on your choices in the hope you make right or wrong choices. Um, I think I should leave it at that, because I don't think we have time to discuss more. But uh, perhaps in the future I can go to the Venezuela case study, which became interesting because in the case of Venezuela you have a country that is uh, almost similar to China because you have uh, basically a, a government that decides what happens that is still a developing country and has a, a let's say with Chavez there in play someone who really tried to uh, manipulate and instigate a redevelopment concept on a large regional scale because of the landslide that took place. These are just quickly going, like I said, Bangladesh is just like an everyday disaster. Here you see rural areas. Here you see basically the grip, the breaking up of the land, you know, the fragmentation of the land, vulnerability. In the case of Bangladesh, because they have these big cyclones, you have these very big kind of modernistic Le Corbusier building structures, which are basically uh, cyclone shelters. So that when a cyclone is coming, everyone knows, go to the cyclone shelter. So these are standing there basically in areas plotted, which are not really well planned out. They're not really places that are of high access. They're usually places where nothing is taking place. So these are basically been put along the lens, and they have helped. So there's been a big you know, decrease in deaths because of cyclones because of this. The problem is that they lose all their livelihood. All their animals, all their agriculture, all their houses are lost. So you save people, but you don't save the system yet. And the interesting thing that one of our students kind of discovered is that these cyclone shelters are built on the five laws of Le Corbusier. You know, from the pilotis to the plan libre to the open space to the windows, etc., etc. So there, it's a real modern mystic moment which you can find throughout this landscape. I'm just going to quickly closed off with Venezuela. So Venezuela is the man. Chavez is there, big disaster took place. He's gonna go and deal with you guys. Now, of course, the issue of slums, we know more or less about. This is the Vargas region on the northern part of Venezuela. Basically got hit, so this is how it takes place. Land formation over years, basically buildings, studies are built on it, earthquake hazard, and the land, because this is instable land, basically, which is basically comes from sedimentation through the rain. When an earthquake comes, the tremors, and the whole system basically collapses. Here you see landslide, water on it, loose land. This took place basically over this entire region here. Here you see basically, you know, of two billion dollars on, on uh, damage, 100,000 affected, 30,000 dead. Immediate response, I mean, there's a huge the U.S. Navy kind of came in or offered itself to help, of course, the political battle between Chavez and America. He says, no, I don't want you guys in here. Then you have universities coming here, private sector, the armed forces. It was a big mess on getting all these people on this entire coastline who had been affected. First thing they did is move everyone to the airport. Transitional plans came. They actually got the, uh, the dean of Harvard, came and was invited to make a, a plan together with them because this is the Chavez approach, bring in a big name and you'll be able to get something done. The problem is, these were the renders that came out of that. So these were the renders for how basically the new city should look like. The problem is, 
if you look at these plans, and most of the inhabitants are living in these informal slums, they started to ask themselves, where are we in this plan? We don't see ourselves in this plan. So you started to create basically the people among themselves started to become ambiguous and curious and had to speculate about what does the government actually have intentions for us. So you actually get a response. For the first time, people started to work against the government. Secondly, the problem with that plan was that it had a before and it had an after, but the plan didn't show how to get there. So for this reason, the plan basically didn't go through. So then we start a big displacement. Chavez comes in. He starts basically, the refugee camps are starting to be put. So people have moved out of the airport area into regions throughout the landscape. It's good to know that Venezuela is the most urban, I mean Caracas, and basically Venezuela as a whole, is the most urban country in the world. 85% of its inhabitants are urban. So you get this huge urban conglomerate taking place there. And basically they're starting to, have to decentralize Caracas uh, through this process. So you get these urbanization processes that start going on. Migrations are taking place, so people actually start moving now because you're put in a place for whatever reason, because by selection, but your family and four other family members are in four other different areas. So people start actually trying reorganizing and responding to the system on their own, trying to build a more cohesive lifestyle. Now, what does the city actually start doing with the national government? They build, or you can call them major Phoenix projects. So I it would be nice to have some time to yeah, finalize. I'll finish up with this Phoenix because it kind of connects to Holland. Here you create basically the, the support mechanism that what Chavez did is he built these major large systems where these people were displaced, hoping for them to move in there. The problem is, as you can see from this diagram, is that there's actually three entry points as far as how it's connected to the normal urban system. And as a result, if you go to these areas now, they're referred to as sleeping cities. So you have these sleeping cities all over the region of Venezuela because people here don't stay in it. They actually all start returning home. Slowly by slowly, and after seven years, some people, of being displaced and moved from one place to the next and either opportunistic or forced, eventually huge migration starts coming. People start returning home saying, hey, you know, it's, it's not happening. And you, we have testimonies from about 150 people from all different sectors, you know, responding to a similar kind of for all different reasons why they actually have to come back home. Okay, before the <coughs> small architectural moments, these are the big houses on the coastline that are hit. People are abandoned, they leave the house. People basically invade the house. So these are people who, got, who don't own the house, who have now come back into the city and have squatted this house. The invaders are moved out. Military is then put in to safeguard a house which can't be inhabited because people don't want that. This, of course, is the process of how that actually takes place regarding the, the slumming of the, of the city. People build here, gradually build them on the retention walls. So here's on an architectural scale how basically one of these slums is gradually formed, the irrigation, the sewage system, all self-developed. And eventually, you have basically 60% of Caracas. Alex, uh, 